In the meantime. Right, in the meantime. Okay, so um, some technical glitches there, but we're happy we're back up and we're ready to go to welcome Professor James Millet, just as we um, were saying. So, Prof, uh, you're on the line, you're, you can unmute, and we'd like to welcome Professor James Millet coming to us from somewhere in the United States. Oh, hi. James? Uh, thank you, Josan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. Let me begin as the chairman did a while ago by extending my deepest sympathies to the family, friends, and associates of Comrade Ken McLaren. He was the quiet man of the progressive trade union movement, well-informed, insightful, loyal to his organization and his class, and loved by his family and friends. We will miss him dearly. In confronting the legacy of Comrade Joe Young, we need to think of the man, we need to think of the moment, and we need to think of the message. With respect to the man, I have said basically what I have to say in the tribute written at the time of his death in October 2012. On that occasion, I anticipated that Joe Young's life and service will forever be a shining example to others engaged in the struggle for freedom and liberation in Trinidad and Tobago. Today's webinar bears witness to that prophecy. The complete text of the tribute is posted on the Omrobi website, and you are encouraged to read it. With respect to the moment, I am sure that if Comrade Jo Young were here in this audience today, he would be greatly embarrassed if we spent most of the time just talking about him. He would be much more interested in knowing what we think about the momentous events that shaped the world as we know it, and what we propose to do about that. He would be interested, for example, in knowing where we are, where we think we are, where we are going, and how we are going to get there. In one way or the other, human beings are always preoccupied with these questions. These are the fundamental questions of human existence. These are the questions that we all as individuals are preoccupied with and which our institutions and societies spend a lot of time trying to answer. Cho Young was always interested in fundamentals and I'm sure he would applaud the time spent on delving deeply into the fundamentals with which we are all constantly engaged. But if the questions are simple, the answers are not so simple. And these fundamental questions relating to a modern society have answers that are more complex than anything we have known before. Let us begin by setting the timeline. The master moment, so to speak, is the last 100 years in which the world as we have known it has emerged. Some of you may remember that this is the centennial year of the birth of George Weeks, one of the heroes of the labor movement in Trinidad and Tobago. It also happens to be the year in which Mahatma Gandhi assumed the leadership of the Indian National Congress. Incidentally, yesterday, October 2nd, 1869, was Gandhi's birthday. Over the centuries, discovery had given rise to settlement. Settlement gave rise to exploitation. Exploitation gave rise to the slave trade, slavery, and indentureship, all of which led to colonialism and imperialism, to the plantation mentality, race and racism, mercantilism and capitalism, and super exploitation. In due course, these features triggered resistance and revolution. 
and to the greatest revolution of all, the Haitian Revolution, for which the Haitian people are today still paying what might be regarded as reparations in reverse. For the impudence and temerity in making a real revolution, and an inspiring revolutionary change for black and white people in Latin America in the 19th century. The Haitian people are still paying a heavy price as they did recently at the border crossing in Del Rio, Texas. That is because the inspiration of the Haitian revolution was clear in major events like the Jamaica rebellion in 1865 and in Cuba in 1912, when the party of color gave witness to the fact that the Haitian example was continuing to be extremely powerful in many of the struggles for nationhood taking place at that time. Until the Haitian Revolution, none of the preceding revolutions had placed the issue of fundamental human freedom on the agenda. It goes without saying, However, that without emancipation, there could be no decolonization. Emancipation and decolonization are the, are the two seminal developments in the development of our peoples and their history. The slaves had to be freed from bondage before they could fight for political freedom. In the hundred years after 1789, when the French Revolution broke out, and 1888, when the last slave was emancipated in Brazil, about 10 million black people ceased to be slaves in the, in the Western Hemisphere. This is not to say that they ceased to be exploited. They continue to be exploited, but not under the slave laws that had preceded uh, that, had, that had preceded previously. Here and there, various forms of indentured labor, especially Indian, Chinese, and Portuguese labor, existed particularly in Thousand eight hundred square miles to 129,000 square miles. Germany, Belgium, and Italy, formerly with no African possessions, had acquired 1,900,000 and 865,000 square miles of African territories in 1914. Portugal, the pioneer of pioneers in the opening up of the African and Atlantic worlds won and lost Brazil in the 19th century, but nevertheless acquired important colonial possessions in Angola, Mozambique, St. Thomas, Principe, Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde. Rich in minerals, especially gold and diamonds in South Africa, and rubber in the Congo and palm oil, coconut oil, ivory, and other staples. 
These colonies constituted the white man's boat and richly rewarded those who were minded to assume it. But if 1914 was the high watermark of the new imperialism, it was also the beginning of the decline of European hegemony over the non-European world. As J. Hobson and Vladimir Lenin had argued in their seminal works on the new imperialism, the scramble for Africa and for colonial territories throughout the world was not only a manifestation of the super-capitalistic domination of the non-European world, but also a symptom of the growing contradiction between the European states and a warning of the hostilities that would soon ensue. At the same time, the war coincided with the outbreak of the Russian Revolution in 1917, with significant participation of colonized peoples on both sides of the conflict, and with a growing consciousness of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism among the peoples of Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and the Caribbean. The First World War was followed by a second, uh, an even more bitter conflict with equally devastating effects on the populations of participant countries and with major impacts on the colonial status quo. By 1945, when the Second World War came to an end, two facts were clearly evident. First, the major European powers had been devastated by the war and were no longer capable of administering the colonies in the old ways. Secondly, the peoples of those colonies had been exposed to new factors and influences and were no longer willing to be governed as they had been before. In a certain sense, the upcoming political activists of the period, people like A. A. Cipriani, Norman Manley, Cuba, Uriah, Buzz, Butler, etc., cut their eye teeth in this period of agitation and resistance. In one way or the other, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, self-government and independence were on the agenda. Riots and strikes were breaking out everywhere. And here in Trinidad and Tobago, as we all know, the riots and strikes in 1990-1920 and those of 1934-1937 to 1937-38 resulted in the decisive beginnings of a series of meaningful challenges to the old order. Suffice it to say that thereafter, decolonization became the, um, the main item on the agenda of the day. First in Asia, in Africa, and in the Caribbean, European imperialism was being repudiated and denied. Between the First and Second World Wars, the struggle for Irish independence, as well as a broad Arab nationalism aimed in particular at France and Great Britain, resulted in what was to be the beginnings of the decolonization process. Secondly, thereafter, Secondly, thereafter, independence and decolonization became widespread throughout the English-speaking Caribbean. And independence, autonomy, and self-government became the order of the day. All of this leaves us at a point where we are approaching the 50th anniversary of the decolonization in the English-speaking Caribbean. It is a momentous time in the development of these states and, uh, and particularly of the whole of the CARICOM region. As we speak today about Cho Young, I have to ask myself what Cho Young would be doing if he were here today. I have no doubt that he would have some pointed questions for the participants and organizers of this conference. Where are we going, he would say. How are we doing? And, and, 
And, and how are you going to get there? Capitalism has a concept known as consolidation, which is used in analytical reference to the stabilization of a new trend different from that which existed before. We are now in consolidation. The question is, what are we consolidating? Joe would have wanted to know what were the greatest achievements realized since 1962? Who have been the greatest beneficiaries in the new nation state created in that year? You would also like to know who have been the principal beneficiaries and principal casualties of social, political, and economic initiatives in the first 50 years in which we have enjoyed national sovereignty. He is asking and is waiting for your reply. Where goes the oil and gas industry? And what will replace it when it's gone? He would want to know what's going on with Petrotrain. He would want to know, do we have a clean energy program? What is going on with the education system? What are we doing to fix it? What is the state of play with some of the nation's major economic assets? What about the healthcare system? Is it true that black lives do not matter in a country that has been run by black people for most of the past 50 years? Joe Young does not know the answer to these questions. Neither do we. We would like to know. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James. Thank you very much for that setting the context um, for our discussion this evening, which is framing what was the global context and bringing it right through. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a question of announcing what is the progressive question now? Who, uh, who is going to answer it? What is going to happen? Um, I was thinking that we should, we should, we have that deep spirit. So help us um, explore this question. Some other interview. If I am to describe Joe Young, I, I will describe Joe as the best all rounder in the trade union movement, akin to Gary Sobers. Because Joe was no ordinary trade unionist. I mean, he, Joe was politically developed his working class consciousness. He was an articulate, a very powerful speaker, charismatic, capable of mobilizing workers with his well-informed perspectives. The irony is that Joe was Joe was no academic in the in the academic sense of the word because Joe only reached, as he told me, either third or fourth standard in, in, in primary school. So that Joe was essentially what can best be described as a working class intellectual. Joe also ensured that TU developed a recording in progress department. The organizing department, that is to say, with specific responsibilities for organizing the unorganized workers, an art that is, you know, sadly absent today. He was blessed with natural leadership skills. He wasn't insecure. He allowed a thousand flowers to bloom. He was never concerned about whether you were a male or female comrade with tremendous ability and, and leadership skills. Once you had a contribution to make in the interest of Tiu, you were embraced by Joe Young. You also ensured that there were well-organized and instituted organized educational seminars for the shop stewards and branch officers because Joe understood that workers pay their dues for quality service from the shop floor to the Ministry of Labor, to the strike camp, to the lockout camp, or to the industrial quarters in case may be. But most important, and I don't use the words genius lightly. Joe Young was a genius in the field of industrial relations. I can think of no other trade unionist, leader or otherwise, who was as skilled and learned as Joe. 
I have been pondering over the last couple of months during this pandemic, if Joe was alive, the same question that, that James was asking, what he would have been doing in this present period. And I'm absolutely certain in my own mind that Joe would have already composed a number of articles, pandemic related, with specific reference to its industrial relations um, issues. He would have already composed a number of articles written to the employers where they had recognition, for example, PTSD. Articles to be included in a supplemental collective agreement so that instead of persons reacting to whatever the employer or the government has been doing during this period of the pandemic, insofar as it impacts on the trade union movement and workers, Joe would have seized the initiative and demonstrated the leadership required and have tabled before employers articles with a specific reference to the pandemic. You know, for example, how do you deal with sick leave in relation to the pandemic? How do you deal with pandemic leave? The medical procedure for workers who have been certified medic for medical reasons that are prohibited from vaccinations. Medical insurance arising out of COVID illness, that is critical illness arising out of persons vaccinated or otherwise. The whole question of mandatory vaccines or not. Working from home, layoffs and retrenchment, compulsory vacation leave and so on. I am absolutely certain that Joe would not have been reacting. He would have initiated these proposals and have them tabled for collective bargaining purposes. And then if we were to visit some of Joe's major contributions, the 1964 bus strike, those of us who travel in PTSE buses today, and enjoy free rides and or cheap rides. Remember Joe Young, who in settling that, that strike, he and T. Wu, Clive and Trevor and the others would have insisted on the question of the nationalization of the bus industry. So that today ordinary people enjoy, as I said before, free and or cheap rides on buses. That's Joe Young. All of us who enjoy as an industrial relations principle the right to be heard before we are disciplined in the workplace as a principle of natural justice. Joe was one of the principal architects of that industrial relations principle when he first argued in the industrial court before the then president, Isaac Hayatali, the whole Cain and Abel story, where he was arguing, well, if Cain, if God had to ask Cain to give an account as to why he erred before God instituted industrial, in, in, instituted discipline, and Joe was arguing, if God could do that, then who is man? And for 55 years or more, a number of us who have access either to the industrial court or in our day-to-day -day dealings at the workplace are beneficiaries of that important industrial relations principle that Joe was a major architect in that regard. Joe also made an important contribution when Winsy Bruno, again at the industrial court, insisted that trade unionists must come to the court dressed in suits and jacket and tie. And Joe insisted, no, this is a court of the ordinary man and we must be able to come here in our union jerseys, dressed properly, yes, but representing our unions and let her walk out of the court. And the court came to a standstill for a while. Eric Williams had to intervene and others. And that is how today, the trade union movement 
and the advocates representing workers are able to come to the court, not necessarily in jackets and tie, as Winsy Bruno felt it was an insult to him and others. When Joe was approached by the Prime Minister of the day to be a judge at the court, that invitation came when he was then at the Oil Fees Workers Trade Union. I was present, because I myself worked there at that time. And Joe was there as a labor relations officer. And the Prime Minister of the day said to Joe, you know, we need to have a recommendation and you must bring it to me as soon as you get it. And Joe was in a quandary as to where he would get this recommendation from. And then he decided, you know something? Let's go by Isaac Ayatali's chambers to get a recommendation for the prime minister. And we went there. And the secretary told Joe, Sir Isaac has seen the president of the country, who at the time was A.N.R. Robinson. And Joe said to her, okay, I will, I will come back. But those of us who know Joe know he had a very powerful voice. So Isaac heard Joe's voice from in his chambers, came out and hailed out him, Joe, Joe, what do you want? And Joe told him. And Joe and Sir Isaac Ayatali wrote Joe's recommendation with a fountain pen. Now, those of us, there are some of us who may not know the significance of that. But those in the legal fraternity will know that when a senior counsel writes something in a fountain pen for you, is an indication of the high esteem in which you are held. In fact, two or three years into his, into his um, advocacy on behalf of workers at the industrial court, Sir Isaac Hayatali was the first president of the court, was already recommending to the authorities that Joe be made a judge. I'm simply raising these points to indicate the industrial relations quality of Jo Young and the esteem in which he was held and the respect. Jo was also responsible for bringing UE workers into the OWTU because he was their special advisor and they had what we normally call a, a house union. And, 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 and Jo organized those workers and brought them into the Oil Fees Workers Trade Union. And those workers were able to enjoy for the first time after a very historic strike um, terms and conditions of employment um, that they never enjoyed before. So that that is what Joe Young was. I know the other speakers will have many much more to say, but I just want to call, I'm hoping that persons from TU in the leadership position are tuned into this exercise. It is time that Tiwoo's call be renamed to honor the legacy of Jo Young. You can find the appropriate name, whether it be the Jo Young Hall of the Revolution or Jo Young's Hall for Peace, Spread, and Justice. But Joe died since 2012, and it is long overdue that Jo Joe's legacy be honored at least in that regard. It is so ironic that when Joe died in 2012, from my understanding, it was he who was representing 50 years of their own existence. So that, that will be the sum total of my contribution. Thanks for listening, and long live the legacy and the spirit of Joe Young. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very much for being so we still um, a justice at the uh, Industrial Court, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and, you know, we just want to take this moment to say, you know, anything that can, can what was it? Anything yeah, that could go wrong, will go wrong. Will go wrong. It could go wrong, but this is like will. <laughs> this is like will. But, you know, there, there were some challenges with the bad weather and so last night, and we were taking in. in at least two remote locations for control of this. Yeah. We thank you so much for your patience, but we know that the content is so rich and uh, we want to thank you for just bearing with us and hope that it doesn't drop again. Um, 
Robert, in this segment as well, we have um, Albert Aberdeen. Albert Aberdeen is uh, Albert is retired now. Isn't no, he? he's not retired. He's not retired. He's, retired. Yet. Okay. he's here 21 years at the International Court. Right. Okay. So we have um, Albert. Are you with us? Have you signed? Uh, is is he with us, Albert? Sure. Albert, are you ready? Um, yes, I am. Albert, we, as we said earlier, Albert recorded our 130 minutes in the UK. Yes. Now we're going to go live because of how the, the technology yes. are, are thinking. So, Albert, um, you met yes. you when you were homeless. You started there. And then yes, when well, when I first met Joe, I was 18 years of age. Albert, are you ready? Yes, I am. Hello? Yes? Yes, yes, you did. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, it is really an honor and a privilege. Like. And I thank you for the opportunity um, of saying a few words on this occasion. Um, before I, I do that, permit me an opportunity to ex express my condolences and uh, sadness at the passing of um, Kenneth McLaren, Mark as I knew him, who I have known um, for more than 40 years now. In fact, I have, I have known Mark since he was um, a member of TU when he was joined in, in 1973. And uh, he became the chief organizer of the union. Uh, another working class intellectual as far as I'm concerned. He was the chief organizer and responsible in great measure for bringing members into the union in the various multiplicity of branches that the union had um, organized at that time. So um, my condolences to his family, his wife, his children, his friends. On, on, on the very sad occasion of his passing. Remembering Jo Young is not easy to do in the sense that there is so much to remember, so much to recall. One might find oneself rambling um, and having, uh, you know, spending a lot of time reminiscing. But I think that the, the purpose of this exercise must in part be to try to locate Jo Young in the context of his contribution to the Trinidad movement, his overall contribution to the development of uh, the society as a whole. Uh, and, I, uh, and, and that would be uh, justifiable. When I first came to know Joe, I was 18 years of age, as I said. I had joined the workforce at Coconut Growth Association right out of school, secondary school. I wanted to work. I didn't want to um, stay at home. And I decided to try to enter the workforce, and I did so. I met Joe while um, employed there and having experienced certain difficulties at work, uh, confronted the difficult situation of working in terrible conditions and experiencing all the uh, deprivation and all the, the difficulties. Uh, TU was organizing, began organizing the workers at Coconut Growers. I became a leader in that tribe to bring to you in. And I eventually became the chairman of the branch that was organized at CJ when the union eventually gained recognition of CJ. Incidentally, that's how I first met Clive Nunes and people like Alvin Brewster. So, so I would have been 18 years of age going on to 19 when I first came into contact with Joyo. Now, immediately you got into contact with Joe, you came into his presence. You knew right away that this was a 
on ordinary post. This was not a, an ordinary post. This man had something special about it. Uh, was tall man, very imposing physical presence, with a voice that boomed, but nevertheless it was welcoming and warm. And he was a great listener. He had the skill and the patience of listening. That was a quality which uh, endeared you to him. You could tell him your story, speak your truth, and he would listen. And so, uh, that's when I first met him. He, at the time, described the difficulties that went on in the Union in the period subsequent to the bus strike of 1969 and the, in the, the lead up to the 1970 uh, rising, the Black Power Movement and so on. And it was very clear when I first came into T and met Joe that T would owe a small union relatively insignificant in terms of its numbers, five, about five, 6,000 members, uh, exercised a tremendous influence in the society as a whole among three, other trade unions and on the development of the various struggles that were taking place. In fact, it, as I understood it, that uh, in the aftermath of the bus strike of 1969, in fact, on the anniversary of the bus strike, which was on the 21st of April, 1970, uh, sugar workers, uh, university workers, led at the time by, uh, who became Matanga Daga, then get the stranger, uh, came to join, were coming to Paul's speak, coming to Tom, so to speak, to join with TU in marking the anniversary of the bus strike of 1969. And there was the, the declaration of a state of emergency by the, by the government at the time. Uh, so one could see the natural flow uh, and the development and the merging of those important historical uh, developments, occasions, leading right into the uh, detention uh, and uh, the curfew and all the, the various aspects of the state of emergency of 1970. Uh, then came 1971, and again there was a state of emergency when again TU and other unions um, the order with you and so on. Again, uh, were engaged in various activities, yeah, principally organizing workers uh, who were unorganized. Um, and again, there was a state of emergency. So it is in that background, in that entire melee, that kind of uh, social flux and the, the, uh, a kind of uh, crucible, which uh, conflagration, if you will, of, of struggle, of, of people moving, of, of demands being made, of, of the state uh, reacting, of, of people crying out for, for justice, racial unity and equality, workers who are struggling to, to find job security, to get improvements in the terms and conditions. It was in that crucible that I met Joe. And um, it was amazing that uh, he would listen. And I, I remember one day while I was addressing the, the workers at the CGA branch um, about some problems which they had held, uh, Joe turned to me in, after that meeting and said, um, I want you to become the chief defense officer of the union. And I want you uh, to take part and to campaign and to be a contestant 
in the union's election. Um, and that was the first election that the union was going to hold um, using the method of one voter, one vote. The only other union that elected its leadership by that method uh, was the old WTU. It uh, was then led by George Weeks. So it is in those circumstances that I met Joe. And in my view, uh, he had the strange ability, the insight, to look and to see um, in people uh, potential and capacity that they didn't see themselves. He could see that you could play a role that you didn't imagine for yourself. And he was the kind of person who um, didn't impose a view on him, but allowed you to expose and to, to, to um, express yourself, be yourself. So, he possessed a kind of approach to every situation, he brought to every situation. Not wild platitudes, but deep analysis. Uh, he was always a person contemplating, um, very contemplated. Uh, uh, he would study a situation and he would speak only when he held the view that there was something um, significant to say, something worthwhile being said. Uh, The outstanding thing, I think, uh, you know, about Joe, some of the outstanding differences I could consider that he um, had that distinguished him uh, from other trade unions and other leaders at the time was, as I see it, his analytical clarity. depth of uh, and grasp of the subject matters. Uh, his irresistible logic and balance that he brought to any situation. I think um, those were qualities which were very um, evident and which you, you, you got immediately you came into contact with analytical. He looked at matters from all angles with balance, get the facts, examine them, look for a solution. So that you could, one could easily say that Joe was a working class intellectual. I hope you agree, I make the point that Joe left school terrible. And standard to standard. He would always say that um, the information is there, you just have to get up and go and get it. And without the information, you can't go forward. His view was that not just that the trade union was not just uh, an organization that should represent workers and get for them uh, improve wages and conditions, better conditions of work. Uh, but it ought to be an organization that encourages workers to see the wider society and take an interest in the problems uh, generally of people and to fashion an approach to taking part in the solution that was formed. I uh, can see that he was indeed a, a working class in the electoral who contributed uh, immensely to the spread and development of the trade movement. Um, he would often say to me and to others that what 
opportunity not to be in his presence. But the value of a person is to be measured not by his wealth or his possessions, but by his view of how people should live. And by his actions that he was prepared to take in pursuance of those. That was the view that he held. And he worked tires tirelessly to pursue the realization of that view. After all, he formed team, an institution through which he would work for the protection and for the advancement of work life. He would often say that I am doing the work as well, and the work will speak for itself. And that is what he did. He did the work, and the work did indeed speak for itself through the collective bargaining process. He improved the lives of untold thousands of workers and families generally. Through his mentoring and his interactions with people in you know, all spheres. Cultural sphere trade union sphere, political sphere. He influenced many young persons, like myself, to discover their own hidden potential and their capacity for leadership, to adapt and to adopt positive lifestyles, to develop social conscience, and they become sensitive to the plight of poor and the oppressed, downtrodden, powerless, those who were suffering from discrimination, and prejudice, plight of women and young people. Encouraged and influenced people in that direction. And his influence was powerful. Influenced people to make uh, those kinds of choices, to dedicate lives to those causes, to be willing to make the kind of sacrifice necessary uh, to see improvements in the social conditions of people generally, to be willing to make that sacrifice. become progressive influencers and progressive influences on the society as a whole. In every field, whether it be art, culture, law, politics, economics, humanism, and above all, industrial relations. The contribution of Joyo long felt and experienced uh, even without us um, recognizing his influence on the development of the industrial relations principles by his involvement um, in the industrial court. His participation at that level, he was one of the first persons in 1965. In fact, when he records a uh, uh, a review, one will see that Joe Young himself uh, developed this skill and insisted on the development of those skills by members and officers of the union going to that place. So that it is without say, without it goes without say that his contributions are immeasurable. It's difficult to measure, quantify, 
and so on. And I can only be grateful that I was blessed with the opportunity of met him and to, in a sense, be mentored by mentored by. I, I, I benefited tremendously from that. And I think um, along with other persons who today are leaders of trade unions, uh, who today are leaders at various levels of, of in art and culture and, and, and in politics, uh, should do the honor, should honor him and remember him and, and continue to remember him and celebrate his life. That's what I was I want me to upload the video that you did um, onto yes. you. Um, and we'll be able to prepare for it to be soon. I don't think we'll do the whole interview. Um, because the hour 10 minutes, you can go on. Um, yes. I'm sorry that we just told you that you had to do this time, but you did well. Yes. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Um, positive, uh, progressive influencer, progressive influence. I think that's a a in the young people's parlance, that's a great new hashtag. Progressive influence, progressive influence. Robert, I know, um, well, we, we come back because we actually have Clive Nunes standing by as well. Clive, we can see you, so you can, uh, yeah. Clive Nunes, who was in the trenches with uh, Joe Young and the Transport and Industrial Workers Trade Union. Good evening, Clive. Oh, it's not yeah. like, yes, good evening. Clive, Clive was looking somewhere else. He's looking at the right. And I'm looking at the, the, the organizer at the railway department, um, John, John, John Forrestry, and he still hung out with um, the WhatsApp uh, shoemaker and variety store, I think it was Street Street or Frederick Street. Um, Clive, are you ready? Right, well, we maybe he maybe he was taking a break. Yeah, well, uh, no, actually, what we can do, um, because at the top, um, with the little technical difficulties, right, we can have some, a, we can, yeah, we can have Professor Sweet sort of, um, uh, do his welcome, you know, or or get a bridge with somewhere before we go to the next segment, Winston. Uh, because uh, our audience, I mean, we will acknowledge quite a few people in the comments in the audience, but I'm throwing it to you, Winston, uh, for you as chairman of the movie and, and co-chair of the proceedings today with Robert Young of the club. Share some um, of those thoughts that you did at the very beginning. I would like to, to bring to the attention of the gathering one. When I left Trinidad for Jamaica in 1965, the bus service was PTS, PT, in place of PTSD, was owned by a private company. In 1965, when I came back, PTSC was an entity. It was the child of Jo Young. But above all, it was one of the first areas of the national economy to be nationalized. And I think for this, it was a it was a flag pointing the way, not only for development in Trinidad, but in the rest of the Caribbean. I want to point briefly to another issue. We are gathered here today to recognize, to, to honor, to remember the contribution of Julio. But when we had a similar exercise for George Weeks, I bemoaned the fact that we have waited until many of these people, our national heroes, have died. But I am also pointing to another issue, that we not only have no national heroes representing the four critical periods, slavery, colonialism, etc. But we have no 
national park named after our national heroes. No boulevards, no streets, no walls, no buildings. And one wonders if this is not part of why we are still struggling to be a nation. I want to tell you something else. Joe Young, like George Weeks, refused a national award because they believed that at the time it was offered, it was tainted. But we in the working class movement must honor our national heroes. We must remember them not only in seminars and webinars and conferences. We must call on the university to focus attention and document the lives and contribution. Albert talked about Joe's contribution, not only to negotiation and resolutions, but his contribution to the legislative regime, to our laws in industrial relations in Trinidad, and by extension in the, the Anglophone Caribbean. And I am calling for the naming of streets, boulevards, parks to honor our national heroes. So at this point, what we have done here today is the second in a series. The first was, was George Weeks. And we, we aren't going to tell you yet, but we are planning to mount similar exercises for the people who have given the most to this country and who we think are the national heroes of the working class and of the people of Trinidad and Tobago whether they have passed on or they are still with us. At this juncture, I will say no more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Winston. And that's a good segue. Let's see if we've gotten um, a slide back. Slide is not back. Okay. Actually, what we like, we have Rhoda, and you know what, Robert, we have some really nice comments here. I mean, while people sat through some of the technical issues, um, all very positive, Mark and Kernan, and great contribution, comrade, who's so well articulated. That was really Joe. The listener, thank you. His honor, Russo, always a powerful and informative contribution. Comrade Aberdeen, so many years, looking good. Nice contribution. Pamela Lutchman, just joined in my audio is good. Oh, great. Mr. Aberdeen is, Mr. Aberdeen is quite informative. Uh, Judy Charles, it's always refreshing to hear the history of Tibu and what was That's done. President, actually. President, president. Uh, by our past president, Joe Young. Pamela Lutchman, uh, mm. we need to remember our past to appreciate our present, exactly what mm. the has been talking about. Um, and uh, Shami Antoine J. Mm -hmm. a contribution from Albert Aberdeen. Um, let's see if we don't have Clyde Roller is actually up on <coughs> our screen and ready to go. Is so actually we're going to go. Roder. Roder, Professor Roder Reddell. Thank you, Roder. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm so pleased to be part of this session remembering Joe Young, and I look forward to the other sessions that we understand will be coming. Like many others, I met Joe as a young woman, a recent graduate from the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica, in the mid and late 1970s, brimming with energy and enthusiasm, and like other people of the period, committed to doing my bit to transform the society in which we lived. Of course, we thought it would be much easier than it has turned out to be. The decade of the 70s was a significant and historic decade in Trinidad and Tobago and globally. What I recall is just how much time I spent in the red, black, and green John Humphrey designed Tiwu building at the Eastern Main Road, Laventil. At that time, much newer and definitely impressive. That was a heyday of labor-oriented politics and action in Trinidad and Tobago. 
but it was also a period of the nascent second wave feminism in this country and internationally. This building was the happening place for progressive politics of the time. It was here that we attended Puerto Rico Solidarity Committee meetings, giving our support to the independence or independentista movement of Puerto Rico. It was here also that we attended meetings of the Cuba, Trinidad and Tobago Solidarity Association. Later, it would also house meetings of the Grenada Solidarity Committee. And it was here that I would meet Joe Young. This towering figure, with his calm and quiet appearance, giving little evidence of the fire that lay below. It was here as well that I would meet Clive Nunes, shorter and certainly not quiet. Joe's opposite in many ways, but I think both committed to similar goals in their own complex ways. It was here as well that meetings of one strand of the emergent feminist movement was held in the 70s and 80s. Concerned Women for Progress often held its International Women's Day commemorations there. Young feminists and progressive activists like Kathy Shepard, Patricia Mohammed, Gayatri Paragras, Cheryl King and others were among those frequent in this space. Women labor activists like Thelma Henderson and Tara Ramuta were founding members of the TU Women's Arm and would later be active members of and or employees in the women's movement of the 80s and 90s, both becoming members and employees of the regional organization CAFRA, the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action, and Tara, national representative of CAFRA TNT. This was also the case for Shafira Khan, founding member of Bank and General Workers Union, who also became a member of CAFRA and treasurer of CAFRA TNT. Shafira was also a member of CWP. I remember the debates taking place at this time with many comrades, some of them here today, on whether unions should have women's arms at all. And if so, what should be their role? To make tea or to make trouble? Like our sisters throughout the region, we questioned many aspects of the radical politics of our male comrades, the machismo, the hierarchalism, and the sexism. But we still saw ourselves as part of this larger movement for social justice, sorry, for social change, equity, and justice, much of which in those early days found a place at TU. Our early experiences in these organizations would lead to the further development of the second wave feminist movement in Trinidad and Tobago. And now I just wanted to show a few slides, if I may. Right. So I just have a few slides of International Women's Day at the Transport Industrial and Workers Union during the Jo Young era. Here we have us with our very, uh, what shall I say, uh, creative banner sitting on the stage. And this is Clotel Walcott. I think this might be Cheryl King and some others. Then we have here Thelma Henderson, who worked at TU and later at CAFRA, dietary paragraphs, now an attorney at law, focusing on women's and children's issues, and also a member of CAFRA, and of course, the late, great Clotel Walker. Clotel was not a member of CWP, but at our events, we would invite other activists, and Clotel was one of our favorite. In fact, we'll soon see her again. Here we see Shafira Khan, at that time, a the early founding member of the Bank and General Workers Union. There's this young person there with huge glasses. And Carol Drakes, who also was a member of CWP. And here we see Shafira again with Cheryl King and others. And here we see 
a Tara Ramuta, uh, who I met in the in the uh, in the TU office, and of course Kathy Shepard. It was at TU as well that I attended social and cultural gatherings with Calypsonians and other performers. The TU Hall was in many ways a community center for its members, the people of the community, and others. In some ways, this reflected Joel and his comrades' larger vision of a labor movement and its wider role in the society, going beyond the limited vision so often reflected today. Now, I had some information on Joe's work in the union and his early development, his mentorship, et cetera, but I'll move on. Former TU employee of the time, Tara Ramuta, observed that Joe loved to have young people around and to guide and teach them. He felt that they were his children. In his later life, after his resignation from the union and his life as a farmer, Joe would become an advisor to the University Allied Workers Union. I think you've heard all of that. But the trade union movement has always been characterized by both solidarity and friendship and rivalry and antagonism. And while there is an inherent sense of fraternity and brotherhood, as of course, despite the increased evidence of women's leadership, it is still a male-dominated institution, this brotherhood is a exemplified in the use of the term comrade. It has also been an extremely macho kind of organization, which characteristically pits man against man, hence the perception of the need for big men in this business. So alongside the sense of brotherhood and support, there is always also a feel, there's also There were also strong conflicts of personality, power, personal and sexual politics, resulting in the internal and external upheavals that eventually thwarted much of the positive potential of the labor movement as a whole, with the, with the result that our country itself has been the loser. Joe's humility, humility was legendary, and much has been said about his refusal to accept national honors. In his tribute to Joe Young at his passing, Rafik Shah titled his essay, Last Man Standing, to refer to Joe's refusal to submit to pressure to change his position. Joe also loved the land and the sea, and like his colleague Michael Isles, tried to make a living from agriculture, a precarious possibility at best, at the best of times in this country. Joe, as many have mentioned, represented an era of what I have referred to as proletarian intellectualism and a tradition of self-educated persons, men and women with limited schooling, sometimes up to primary school, but who through their own efforts and for their own enlightenment had acquired great knowledge and a highly developed intelligence. Michael Ailes had this to say about Joe. As a working class writer, he put forward his ideas in a clear and precise way. He was an excellent industrial relations officer, and I learned a great deal from him in dealing with the industrial court. I studied his arguments in shaping my submissions, and then I began to win cases. The late Justice Ayatali, as we all heard before, once remarked that Jo Young's greatest mistake was not to study law he would have made an excellent labor lawyer. But in fact, perhaps he did already make an excellent labor lawyer and eventually an excellent judge. Somewhat the way in Trinidad and Tobago, this quest for learning was replaced by the quest for qualification or papers <laughs> serious effects. Joe, like the majority of labor and social movement activists, of the first six to seven decades of the 20th century, read extensively, studied, and wrote. They produced periodicals, newspapers, and other materials, which they shared free of charge, or at little charge, to those they sought to reach. I want to call today 
for return to that proletarian or grassroots intellectual, like intellectualism, and for unions and social movement organizations to take leadership in this regard. We need a different approach to education that emphasizes, and this is not just for trade unionists, this is for the entire society, that emphasizes self-learning, the transfer of knowledge, and education as personal empowerment, and not just as papers to get a job. We have to find ways to encourage widespread reading and reflexive writing, once again, beginning with the young and hopefully also beginning in the unions. Finally, I want to use this occasion to call once again, and I think this was already mentioned, for a labor history project, possibly through a collaboration with the union federations and libraries, for example, at the Cipriani College, NALIS, or UWE, to collect, document, index, catalog, and digitize the, the documents, archives, and visual material of the labor movement to facilitate research, analysis, and publication for the present and the future. This material would need to be supported by oral interviews with a wide range of labor leaders, members, employees, and other personnel who have a wealth of knowledge and, like Clive Nunes, are still around. This would be an opportunity for younger trade unionists to interview older comrades and facilitate the intergenerational learning that is so important. So as we celebrate the life and work of Joe Young, let this be a time for introspection and reflection by the labor movement and all those who are committed to social justice and to make things better in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean and inevitably to change the world. This is a critical time in our local and global history. And what we do now will be determine where we go in the future. So reflections like these on the life of Cho Young could give us some important indications of what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rhoda. Um, Robert, I, I, I can't imagine what it must be like for you sitting here. I mean, I know the work that you did in the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. uh, recording, and you'll yeah. talk a little more about that as well. Um, we, we have a few people who are not going to contribute today because of the, the publications were recorded. People like um, um, Trevor Katasi, who, who started off as a, as a bodybuilding partner of Joe. Right? Um, or when we served, I think he's logged on, but I don't know if Swami Vishnu will come on to me. He actually was, his, his uncle was married, his aunt was married to, to my uncle, Desmond, and then he met you at the conference for, for I'd say, in 1665 of the uh, Workers and Farmers Party launch. And when he, then he met you, he met Pandey, he met uh, George Weeks. Taylor was involved in that, um, Taylor James. Uh, so we have a good bit of information recorded that we would have to, to, to have featured on the post website, on Boris web, website, and also on the Facebook page. Yeah. Um, we will not cover uh, that picture. Well, you know, um, Rhoda actually referenced um, Rafi's uh, tribute to Joe. He's Uncle Joe to me, by the way. <laughs> I feel so kind of bad saying Joe, Joe. You call him, you must call him Joe. I don't know what you think you got. You know, you are. Hello. So, you know, but he was Uncle Joe to me. Um, sure. So, you know, now I'm, I'm hoping that Rafiq is, Rafiq Shah is uh, listening, he's tuned in. This is Rafiq's column. It's a revision, actually, of a column he wrote being tribute to Joe Young when he passed. So let me see if I can do this justice here. In October 2012, one of the, this country's great labor leaders and patriots, Joe Young, made his exit from life. Not a drum was heard, not a funeral note, as this gentle giant was hurried to some more unmarked and indistinguishable from other corpses. Not that he would have wanted otherwise. It was his final interaction with the ordinary man with whom he had lived and mingled freely, 
for whom he fought many a battle. At age 80, Joe must have endured more than he could in this cursed country that he so loved. He was ready to join his ancestors, to relink with old comrades. As I write this tribute to a Colossus, who in countries that value their human treasures would be the focus of celebration, I envisage the puzzled looks on the faces of many readers, especially those younger than age 50. Joe Young, we see. Like Shah didn't take his pills this morning. There's so much to write about. The budget, corruption, collapse of institutions, scandals. All that he could come up with is the passing of another old geezer. Listen, my children, as Ras shortly intoned. Learn a thing or two about one of our genuine patriots. A man who truly cared for his country. One who asked not what the national coffers could run his way, as so many pirates, pirates masquerading as patriots do and have done over many years. Instead, he gave all he could for other citizens to benefit, especially the working classes and the working poor, who ranked highest on his priority list. Joe enjoyed a basic formal education, which in the 1940s probably meant the full primary school fair. I never asked him about his school. His intellect was such, his language so polished, his thoughts and arguments so structured that one could be excused for thinking he had attained the highest academic accolades. He had not, not in the formal sense. Joe was self-taught. He was a voracious reader, and it helped that he worked for a while in the press room of a newspaper. More importantly, for most of his adult life, he interacted with intellectuals such as C.L.R. James, Lennox Spear, as much as he did with shop floor workers from whom he absorbed the wisdom of the working class that no university can impart. The 1950s and 60s was the period of nationalistic awakening, which for most Afro-Trinidadians meant becoming acolytes or grassroots supporters of Dr. Eric Williams and the People's National Movement. Joe Young, like George Weeks, was different. He developed a social conscience and opted to be a trade unionist, fighting for better wages and working, con and working conditions for workers. In his case, those employed by the bus companies. There were four privately owned bus companies when this country gained independence. The screen is running away with Okay, bear with me a minute. All right. So I'm just going to have to log back into it. There we go. All right. Joe Young, like George Weeks, was different. He developed a social conscience and opted to be a trade unionist, fighting for better wages and working conditions for workers. In this case, those employed by the worst companies. And there were four of them, which I just read. Young was an organizer for the Amalgamated Workers Union, the AWU, in South Trinidad. He met George Weeks, and the two would meet and develop a lifelong friendship. Joe ran a foul of the order of the AWU leadership, which, as was commonplace then, routinely sold out its members to trinkets. By 1962, he had left the AWU, mobilized the majority of bus workers, and founded the Transport and Industrial Workers Union, TU. His vision on that long and winding road, that is, organizing the grassroots, was to have government nationalize and upgrade public transport. It was a tough battle, but by late 1964, following several strikes, he forced government to acquiesce, and in early 1965, the Public Transport Service Corporation, the PTSC, was established. Tiru would still fight to become the sole recognized union for transport workers, which meant more strikes, great battles. When we look at the PTSC fleet of buses rolling across the country today, offering ordinary people a reasonably good service, we must say thanks to Joe Young. If we live to see it bloom into an efficient national transit system that rapidly shuttles tens of thousands of commuters from home to work and school to play fields, 
Watch for that prize-winning smile on the contented face of Joe Young, wherever he is. But this stalwart's contributions to the development of this country went beyond the boundaries of trade unionism. In 1969, at its humble offices on Broadway, Port of Spain, Tivu summoned a meeting of many interest groups to win support for yet another strike the union had called against the PTSC. The list of attendees read like a who's who in the struggle for true independence. It included leaks and senior executives of the OWTU, Gennis Granger, later Makan Daldaga, and a team from the National Joint Action Committee, Lloyd Best, James Millett, Lennox Speer, Basilio Pandey, Vernon Jamadar, and Alloy Alloy Likwai of the opposition Democratic Labour Party. The morning after that fateful meeting, as they blockaded the buses at the, P at the PTSC, backed by the full force of the state apparatus, they tried to get ruling. Many of the above names, as well as young and prime ministers of TV, were beaten by the police and arrested and charged. The incident was seen as a precursor, some might argue, um, to trigger the Black Power Revolution of 1970, in which Joe Young figured prominently. I would get to know Joe well in the aftermath of the revolution, more so after I joined the trade union movement, leading the cane farmers, Island White Cane Farmers Trade Union. This union, while it won wide support after its activation in 1973, could not afford to rent office space. Joe and Tim, in a display of fraternal solidarity, allowed us use of their San Fernando office that ICTFTU occupied for many years. During the formative period of the United Labour Front, that's the ULF from 1974 to 1976, I saw another side of Joe. The original leadership of the ULF comprised Pandey, Weeks, Joe, and me. Also on the executive were prominent comrades like Pierre, Millet, and attorney Alan Alexander. The ULF had come close to crashing several times before the general election of 1976, mostly because of Pandey's dictatorial tendencies. Not long before the elections, with tens of thousands of people already pinning their hopes for new politics on the ULF, one such crisis erupted. Pandey insisted on having his way in the face of near unanimity opposing his stance. Over three meetings, all other members decided that in the interest of the party, they would defer to Pandey. Two held our group, Brown, Joe, and I. Amidst the Germans and persuasion from comrades from whom I had great respect, I buckled. The issue was put to the vote, and I sheepishly supported it. Joe didn't. The key was the last man standing on the he asked that the minutes of that meeting note his disagreement with the decision taken. That involved agreeing to have as a candidate of the new visionary party, a candidate who did not meet the basic standards we had set to draw a line between the whole, what we wanted no part of, and the ULF that would usher in the new democracy. I need add he was later vindicated when Pandey mash up the ULF anyway. That was the metal of the man. He served without seeking office or reward or a war. He was the true servant of the people. Let it be so recorded. Those are the words of Rafi Shah. Robert? I know there's so much to go into here, of course, because everyone has their account, but this is an account of one of the actors mm -hmm. of that time, and to this point, that until we get into documentation, until we are able to interrogate, until we are able to do the analysis, and so, you know, it, it, we just really are sort of, all this information is yeah. in the ether, you know. This is someone's account, their perspective, yes. Rafi Chah. Um, who had an amazing account was, was uh, Robert Musso. Yeah. He was sitting here, plus, um, and just um, I'm just like saying um, the UNF was formed on this September day, in this date, at this time, and we were standing up here because I do this huge, amazing, amazing memory. 
he has to be put into a room, a room with, a, with, with, with many questions and, and recorded because it's, 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 um, we need this progressive radical history recorded, right? Um, and most of this, um, and who the actors were young people, people who were in their 20s, right? So we go to the Cardinals now. Um, I think he's a, was, he's a godfather of mine, actually. Yeah, he's Clive, good evening. Yes, good evening. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. All right. Well, there were some connectivity problems. And what I was seeing on my cell phone was seeing Robert and yourself with a circle going wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and no matter what. But my grandson came to the rescue and we are now downstairs, maybe, you know, the... It was weak upstairs. Um, as you would know, um, Robert, that um, my contribution was pre-recorded, but we know that, and several others, so that Jo Young, I met Jo Young when I was an officer in the National Union of Government Employees. I was an assistant general secretary and I also was the president of the railway section of Nuj. And on Prince Street, there was a Chinese man from China who had a shoemaker shop. And he also had a small variety store. But his views were socialist. And I just gravitated towards him uh, and always speaking with him and so on, knowing more and more about ideology and socialism and all that kind of thing. And um, on one occasion, while I was there, Jo Young came together with uh, Krishna Gowandan, Jordan Singh. They were officers of TU. And um, that's how we met. Um, this would be in early 64. Uh, during the bus strike with the Princess Tongue Special Bus Company, a strike that lasted 56 days, and which the government made attempt by using the police in attempting to break the strike. Although I was not in two, as president of the railway section, I always hold lunchtime meetings with the workers to bring them up to date, what is happening, how they must understand society and the system, what is capitalism, how it exists, how it survives. And during the strike, there were demonstrations by two, and I joined a number of them. And there was one down in San Fernando, because it was, I think it was every Friday. That is during that 56 days strike. Um, I spoke on the platform, and I endorsed, because the union was demanding um, the government take over the bus industry. And they didn't have no sort of support from um, the trade union congress and some of these reactionary leaders and so on. And when I spoke, I spoke supporting the uh, nationalization of the bus industry. And uh, it made a news. Uh, now, remember, I am a, an officer of news union. And... Critchlow was annoyed about that. He was the president general. And he called a press conference and said that what Nunes said was not a nudge position. That was his position. But I continued and I mobilized the railway workers so that every fortnight, workers will be making financial contributions, which I pass on to you. Uh, 
eventually, after the attempt to use the police to break the strike, which they failed, in point of fact, on a particular morning, there were over 200 workers were charged with all the fronts, but it was like a joke down in San Fernando because the, the magistrate would give them bail and they would come back. And then the police van would come, the big black Maria, and they opened the door and all the workers, or a lot of the workers run inside, begging for more charges. That was the kind of revolutionary spirit of that union called the Transport and Industrial Workers Union. And that determination led to the government being forced to take over the bus industry. And that, was, that happened on the 1st of January, 1965. And the PTSC was established as a board on the 1st of May, 1965. And to plenty of people's surprise, the chairman of the PTSC was Carl Tull, who was the secretary general of the Communication Workers Union dealing with the telephone workers and so on. He was also a government senator, not a labor senator, a government senator. And he was also a chairman of the PTSC. So Tull's position on Henry Street, he would be defending workers. In the Red House, he will be supporting repressive legislation against the working class. And at PTSC, as chairman, oh boy, he was determined to get rid of TU. And eventually, sometime in October of 1965, a Saturday, we got a letter telling us that we were no longer a recognized union. Because there were two recognized unions because uh, prior to the government taking over um, the bus service, there were two concessionaires, one in the Port of Spain, East West Corridor, and the other one with um, down uh, the Southwestern Peninsula, and one of the routes were Port of Spain, San Fernando. And therefore, Talno used his position to terrorize. There were endless workers that were dismissed of all kinds of frivolous charges, and it began to pack up an industrial court. In point of fact, Hayatali, who was the president of the um, industrial court, he wrote a judgment against the PTSC, and he said PTSC was the most reprehensible employer in Trinidad and Tobago. Eventually, our union, uh, because I started with TU in 65, because I was fired from the railway by the same tull, good, because the government was determined to close down the railway. And we were really agitating and struggling for the railway not to be closed. You understand? And therefore, uh, I began working with TU after tull fired me. Okay, as an organizer. Hi. So, Clive, um, one, one significant memory of, of you and yourself, how did he influence you? Um, how, how was he supportive of your, your leadership? Um, yeah, if, if, because we, we, we have to um, move along. The history is recorded. We have it on the document. Yeah, if, yeah well, it was pre-recorded. So. Yes. So, so could you... Um, yeah, we, we want to get some more of the... the your insights, and you probably need to move more into it because you kind of off your star. Uh, right, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because really, we're trying to locate Joe in the conversation. So those mm. early years and some of the, you know, the what what transpired, and your your coming into the union with him, because we're yeah. trying to, we're trying to locate Joe in the whole 
you know, the, the historical context which we've been going with and so on, of course, the history of TU and the, the paving the way for the nationalizing of the public transport service. But we want to... Right, but that was done. That, that was done. Sure. Yeah, right? And under Joe's leadership, I will give you an example. The first group of workers that broke the ISA are the system paint workers. And a number of workers were charged, and the union was charged. This is because of the repressive legislation that came into being called the Industrial Stabilization Act, which we, the revolutionaries, call in slavery again. Okay? And we had this, this uh, matter at the Chogonas Magistrate Court. And it was Lennox Spear and Jack Kelchel that told Joe and told us that we must show the magistrate who is still because the union was charged. And when the police started to call Transport and Industrial Workers Union, a couple hundred workers ran into the court, all behind the magistrate, frightened the magistrate. And then Oxpear said, that is only a part of Kiwu. That is the kind of stuff that Kiwu was made from. Break the ISA early, because it was on the 18th of March, 1965. We broke the ISA, and those matters just came to naught. What was Joe's impact on you as someone coming into the, the union? And Clyde, move, move back again more to the center. Yes. Please, yeah. otherwise you're cutting off half your face, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you repeat that? I, I, we're asking you about your interaction, your your sense of Joe Young. Um, you know, we know the work of the union, and, we, and as I said, we have your recorded thing, but we want to get your, your the sense of you and your relationship with Joe Young and being part, coming into the leadership of the team. Him as... The, the the leader of the trade union, of the, of the TV. Yeah, well, I was employed as an organizer because an organizer that was dead did a corrupted act and they had to find. And therefore, do uh -huh. and they say, well, you know, come and work with us. As I told you, I met him before. So he know my ideological position and therefore I fitted it nicely into TV in terms of having that ideology of the working class. We are the defenders of the working class, and he will remain that. And a lot of that has to do with Joe Young's leadership. So that he had several battles. And we had the battle of winning back recognition. Winning back recognition at PTSC, where the very government broke the laws. Their own ISA, because the ISA say that Go the on. minister is to hold account. They have to hold account with the voters voting, balloting, and we won that. But it was to be done in 21 days. But they did it from October. They did not do it until the 8th of March. All that was with workers just getting dismissed left, right, and center. And we were able, the voters, on the 8th of March, they voted for Tiwu because of the type of leadership that Tiwu had. Tiwu had the most struggles. In point of fact, I heard, I think it was Gregory Rousseau spoke about um, the jacket and tie. Again, it was Joe Young and our executive. It was Haida Tali. It wasn't Win Wincy Brood, no. He said, no, we have to come with jacket and tie. We used to have show Jack and so on. And he said, no. And he said, we couldn't do any matters. And we stayed away. That is the metal of T who under Joe Young. We stayed away. But we had the most dismissals in Trinidad and Tobago. And we packed the court up with nearly 300 matters. And they now had to tell us Ayatali had to call us and tell us, all right, but I will put a table at the side. You cannot be on the bar table. That's the kind of revolutionary spirit that we had. And we break that jacket and tie. 
social jack a new color and all that at the side the table at the side all that is Jo Young's leadership right but Tio have the most troubles and was the most militant union in Trinidad and Tobago the history is there all the things that you know and it was Jo Young's leadership and have a united executive and I want to say one thing the Balize was never able to infil infiltrate Tiu's leadership. Never did. And that was the strength. And Joe played an important role in that. And Gowanda and myself and so on. So I know it's time, but I had done, you know, the pre-recorded. So that's giving you some idea about, you know, on the leadership. Sounds like five. Um, we have right. the information recorded. Um, yes. You want to move to Judah, that'll be now? Judah, are you ready? Yes, yes, yes I'm ready. Um, right here. Are you hearing me? Oh, Am I clear? Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, yes. great. First to begin, I want to say it's a, a, a pleasure reuniting with some of my colleagues that have um, represented here today. And um, it is indeed a tremendous uh, opportunity to pay due respect to a labor leader that has been significant in transforming <clears throat> the trade union movement in Trinidad and Tobago, and in particularly assisting the organization to which I have um, given some of uh, my youth Back in the in the seventies, Omrobi, to developing into a organization that had a broader perspective of the role of the uh, a movement such as Omrobi, the Universal Movement for the Recognition of Black Identity. And of course, when we um, after the second. Um, um, what you call um, 71, that 71 um, event, we had to change from an organization that was, we began to realize that talking in, only in terms of re the reclamation of black identity and making the connections and, and recognizing the contribution of um, our ancestors from Africa and um, and so on, we needed to confront the conditions that the uh, majority of people in Trinidad and Tobago, the working class, and that were being, what they were facing. And it had to be beyond this, the, 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 the cultural issues or beyond, uh, beyond the issues of, of, um, of race and so on. And we began, that is Omrobi, we began to take into consideration the economic plight and the social status and the, 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 the relationship that the uh, working class had in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago. And we began to recognize that our, our, our movement had to become more involved and more um, in tune with what was happening in uh, the labor movement at the time. Because it was a very, very, very um, interesting time in terms of the labor movement. Being, um, we had the OWTU in South Trinidad, which is where Omrubi was um, located. And we had the uh, significance of the just coming out of the um, bus strike, which was very significant in terms of just coming before the 1970 events and 71 event. So another part about this is as being from, from San Fernando, you know, I, I grew up in San Fernando, the bus service was important for us to get around, go to school and so on. And it was a big event to, um, for the transformation of that brown bus 
that was running, I think it was the Princeton St. Madeline uh, San Fernando route, to be to to to, to be able to to transform that bus service into uh, a instrument to assist working people and poor people in getting around because transportation is key to the economy and it's key to getting things going and uh, organizing. I, I think um, we earlier today made mention that it was the nationalization of the bus service was perhaps represented a direction that um, it was, if not the earliest, it was, if it's not the first, it's one of the earliest movements that the government of Trinidad and Tobago nationalized a significant uh, element of the, of the private sector for the benefit of the masses of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So I, I think coming out, moving into um, that new dimension, Omrobi needed a, a period to undergo uh, um, a reflection and to, to engage in discussions that would transform the organization from, uh, from just a cultural organization into an organization that is representing and uh, promoting the interests of uh, a movement that is uh, looking at the relationships in the economy and in the society, as a part, uh, as opposed to something that is just simply cultural. And I remember we, we had a lot of meetings in, in at TW T, T building on Eastern Main Road, um, that new building, and. What impressed me as a very young person was the, um, the I, what I was, how I wanted to say it was, is Joe Young was quiet in his disposition, but very loud and clear in, in representing some uh, very important views and very important concepts that we all grappling with and trying to understand and appreciate. He did it in a most effective way. He did it without you really recognizing how um, significant and um, having a, a wide um, and important and deep understanding of what was taking place and what had to continue even though the, the movement was small and just transforming. So Omorobi left, um, left San Fernando as a, as a cultural group in particular and become, and became part of the, uh, a group, uh, the Uni Universal uh, Re 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 Revolutionary Organization, URO, which was primarily a group that was confronting the uh, economic and social relationships in the uh, society, Trinidad and Tobago society. So it, was, it became more um, an organization that had a political context, a political representation, uh, embodiment of socialism. And I think, uh, I shouldn't say, I think I should say quite clearly that Joe Young played a significant part in helping that transformation um, in terms of understanding in a deeper way the relationships in the society. And it's true uh, that relationship with Tiu and Joe Young that we were able to meet with uh, Aberdeen and likes of uh, Rousseau and the likes of um, my dear good friend there, uh, Clive Nunez. So we, we, we had an opportunity to be, um, to engage in a, in, a, in a growth of our organization into a, a very important direction, which I think will 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 have to continue and is continuing, and it's a wonderful opportunity that I I mean I cannot express the 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 the, the pleasure that I have I'm experiencing right now. Um, I'm I'm speaking to you all from 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 New York. I've been here in New York for the past twenty years, so I'm. 
I saw a little bit of the touch what is happening right now back home, but listening to the presentations here this evening, I, I, I feel um, revived, re-energized, and I do look forward for um, a continuation of this um, series. This should be a series of events. I think we, uh, several speakers have touched on it, and we need to, 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 to plan it and um, concretize it. And because there, there are, there's so many things that we need to, 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 to continue to, to address, to, to speak about, to, to, to engage in so that our, our understanding and our clarity will improve. Um, this, is, this is important. And there is the fact that we, have, we need to recognize, recognize the, the, the different aspects of the... Um, the, the working class that has made tremendous contributions, tremendous. Yes, they have given themselves. They have embarked on, on, on journeys with, out of the pure desire to represent and to improve conditions of the people to whom, to whom they, 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 they engage with and, and, and share things with. Thank you very much. I, I, want, I, I, I want to thank, yes, I'm going to I want to thank the, 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 um, the speakers that went before me and those still to come for ensuring that this um, event is, is, is successful in spite of some of the technical challenges that we have. And we're I guess that's all part of the experience. We're Thank we're you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, you. You know, and, yeah. and uh, it, it's a barrage. And I mean, really know that uh, Cecil, who is one of our foremost trade union um, and social activists in the country. Yeah. In his youth, he, you know, distinguished himself as one of the, the rebels. He, he was the uh, he was the cafe manager for the northern um, part of the, the northern part of the country for the Uganda nineteen seventy six elections. I remember yeah, correct, correct. I remember that was correct. I was the chairman of the northern region of the ULF. The northern northern region of the ULF, right? Yeah. I remember he was a twelve year old. It's some cafe that lasted the whole day. Right? Yeah. Um, so, Cecil Paul. Cecil. Yeah, I, I want to thank the, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak on, on, on Joe Young's contribution. I just want to make a few points. Are you all hearing me? Yes, we are. You switch, yeah. um, Cecil, you're all hearing me, right? Okay. Video. Switch the video, please. The host will ask you to start my video. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. Right, there okay. You are. <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. So, Joe has made some major contributions. I just want to briefly point out about seven or eight of them quickly, right? Joe's, what the, the major contribution, I would put as, as number one, is the introduction of a modern public transport system in Trinidad and Tobago after the closure of the railway. Because I could remember the Princess Tong bus service and the Arima bus service, they, they were dumps. One used to go into George Street, right? And um, the Princess Tong bus service used to go somewhere down Independence Square. So that is a major contribution of Joe Young and, and Tiu. The second one, the empowerment of women workers in the retail sector in Port of Spain. I used to work on St. Vincent Street with an oil company, he just started to work. And those women were not easy. They were poorly paid, they were exploited, and they used to burn up Port of Spain virtually two, three times a week. And those women eventually became a strong lobby in TU. So that's the second one. The third one is he forced the government of the day to remove one of the most repressive anti-worker legislation ever in, enacted in the Commonwealth, the Industrial Stabilization Act. And the government was forced to introduce the IRA as a substitute. Cecil, just bring your notes, put it to the, to the right so it could not disappear. In the okay, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, yeah. The other point is that he provided a practical example to trade union leaders. We were not advocates in court. We, we, were not trained to, we were trained to argue on a table, to make a speech, 
to, to activate workers for, to take protest action and so on. He taught trade union leaders how to go in the court and set out a case, argue your case, set up witnesses and so on, and win your case. We didn't know about that. So that we have to, to, to thank him and see that as one of his major contributions. He created a team of fearless leaders. Man, when Tiwu moved went through Trong, with Trevor Contasti, with a trunk full of placard, Krishna Gowandan, serious, serious Marxist, Clive Nunes, who will talk for 10 hours nonstop. I mean, it, it was, Albert Aberdeen came in as a young fella, right? Then you had a fella like um, McLaren, who was the organizer. That was a fearless team of people. Bishop, who was the, the, the kind of clerical man keeping the union, you know, operating, you know, according to the rules and so on, while the, the other guys outside and so on, right, struggling. That's another major contribution, creating an effective team of leaders, right? The establishment of the most powerful mass working class party in Trinidad and Tobago, together with Weeks and Pandey and, and, and Rafik Shah, then Oxpear and, and all those guys, the United Labour Front. Then secondly, in, 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 in terms of, 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 of um, organizing workers' institutions, the Council of Progressive Trade Unions. Joe Young and several others with the breakup of the Trinidad and Tobago Labour Congress after the sugar workers' strike in 65, they formed the Council of Progressive Trade Unions which contributed greatly towards the development of our progressive trade union movement, training and establishment of a new cadre of leaders in the trade union movement. Then, Joan, they expanded TU. TU was in the bus company and then they went into the retail sector, but TU went into the industrial sector. Neil and Massey, the assembly plants, and several other, others pressed it on all those areas. So the union, from a small union operating in transport and a few areas to a large union operating in the industrial sector, Trinidad and Tobago. So Joe, those are the contrib major contributions I see Joe has made to the trade union movement. But the vexing and economic disastrous issues facing Trinidad and Tobago and the workers. Joe is not here again. George Weeks is not here again. Who are the leaders? You know, that is the vexing situation. The current status and the achievements of Joe Young, we are losing them gradually. And it would be frightening because I don't think the current cup of leaders in the trade union movement, at least the majority of them, are not capable. I don't know what happened. But I am scared that all the gains we have made, we are gradually losing them and we may lose the majority. So that we need leaders like Joe Young again in the trade union movement. George Weeks, these guys, Clive Nunes, Trevor Contaste, and, and, and um, Sylvester McLaren. Right, Aberdeen, Gregory Rousseau. We need those leaders again in the trade union movement. So that is my that is how I saw Joe Young as a major contribution contributor to the development of the trade union movement in Trinidad and Tobago and the politics. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks, um, Professor Paul. Um, I would ask you a question. Um, yeah. So, like, say, I had a question around uh, the decision for OWTU to think about thinking about uh, buying the, the refinery. Um, yeah. If there was a progressive stance about what is next, what do you think um, would a union or a group of people who are progressive? Think about what we do, what we need to do next in the space. Um, a professor James Miller um, alluded to it. Yeah. Um, 
The trade union have no business in, in trying to acquire no refinery. And the trade union have no business by aligning with international capital that's questionable to, to own a refinery. The problem of the OW2U and the oil industry, I worked in the oil industry all my life. That is the only place I ever worked. Point 40, point up here, Port of Spain, you know. The tragedy of the OW2U started after George Weeks left. And people started, the leader, McLeod, started to clean the 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 OW to you of people who supported George. When they said up here. Huh? Okay. Yes. yes. But he cleaned he cleaned his slate. I mean, he moved out all of us, right? As you will and you what happened was that he started to play games with the politicians, and that was the death knell of the OW to you. Right? You cannot have a union where you're not training people continuously. You cannot have a union where the members not participating and bringing ideas. The greatest advantage of a trade union is that you keep getting ideas. When you have a general council meeting, ideas. You have a Kosabo, ideas from workers. The day of resistance in Trinidad and Tobago, it was a shop store in Wasa when we formed Sopo, who stood up and said, look, the NRA are going to take away everything we have. They take away we cola, they retrenching us, they cut it, cut in we pay. They're going to pauperize us. Let us get all the other organizations. And we get the churches came in. Right? And of course, the thing the thing get short-lived with Abu Bakr and the, the Muslim. Okay. So but workers, so democracy is important. Yeah. Right, so we have a lot of the cover. So we have one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I just our booster, our booster yeah. to come in. Um he has amazing memory. Um and you can you really can get all of it on. Yeah, yeah. So thank That's you for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, yes. there you go. You're on. Are we ready? Your song, data song. Um, your mic is muted on your end. What is that? Well, you know, you asked Cecil a question and then you had to, to shut it down, but it's, it's me, an important question. But it's here, yeah, and it's the kind of thing that we're going on. We need to continue to have the discussion. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I just would really very quickly go to yeah, see the questions. questions. Um, actually, they're largely, question, they're largely comments. People um, commenting fact that it's a nice historical perspective of the contribution of Joe. Great points, Comrade Cecil Joe. Comrade Nunez, I really like how you emphasize how important Joe Young's leadership was in shaping the culture of TU. You forgot to say that Joe was chairman of the meetings that formed the ULF. Um, uh, in other words, his leadership meaning Joe cultivated unity and thus made TU militant and gave us strength, making us a force to be yeah. Do we have uh, we have more okay, okay, okay. yeah, so we have a yeah, you're here, I'm not next you. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, um Robert, I I thought that um the recording would have been on. Right, but it, 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 um it's the glitch the, the technology is not working yesterday. Um As I indicated on Tuesday when we, we had that session, I met Joe Young in 1965. And that was at the, the, the formation of the, um, the first conference, the forming con conference of the Workers and Farmers Party. I met um, Young, Weeks, James Millet, and several several others, Alan Alexander, the, the, the whole works going back. And um, <clears throat> that started my relationship with, um, with Joe. 
At that time, I was employed with a company named s and Kelly Rentals. Um, what? And at that time also, Kiu had a position that they were more, they were only interested in um, organizing transport workers because of the name. That um, decision was subsequently changed. Tellurentals eventually became a branch in Kiu. I um I left the rentals in um nineteen sixty six. Nineteen sixty six I think it was. it was. What had happened is that um we had several problems. I was on vacation, the workers took a position and stopped working and management terminated everybody. That happened at the end of the week when I went to work the Monday. I had my job. And I told the manager that I would only decide to work if all my fellow workers was coming back to work. And that didn't happen. And I remain unemployed. And um, I started to be around the union and was employed in 1967 as assistant to the full-time officers. As um, was indicated earlier, the union had its first one member, one vote in 1972. Joe approached me to contest the office of grievance officer. I served in that office for two years. And in the two years with um, 75, 78, the, the union constitution was amended. And um, Joe again approached me on this occasion to contest the office of third vice president. Um, my relationship, and I would, I would say that I was very close to, to Joe. I learned a lot from him. He was my mentor. And outside of, there, there are some important things that were done in terms of um, collective bargaining under the leadership of Cho Young. I recall that it was in the, sometime in the 60s, Joe had taken the position that the union was now going to start a campaign with the employers, the workers that we, we represent, the, empl the employers, For a dollar an hour lowest wage in the industry, what, whatever industry, on skilled worker, a dollar. At that time, those rates used to be 60 and 75 cents an hour. That was achieved. Another, another campaign that was mounted, because during that period, the working hours in Trinidad and Tobago was 44 hours per week. And the union under Joe leadership started a campaign for 40 hours per week. Work week. That was achieved without any reduction in pay. So but from, 40, from, 40, from 44 hours to 40 hours, automatically there's a, a hourly rate increase. And the third, the third, there's a third, and, and the third was maternity leave for female, female workers. And anybody who goes back 
into um, agreements, whether it was industrial agreements or collective agreement, as it, it is now called, you would see that TU under maternity leave, workers were entitled to 13 weeks paid maternity leave. Where in other, with, or with other unions, you had a 12 days and one maternity in every um, maybe, maybe, maybe um, right. okay, yes. 12 days maternity 12, 12 weeks 12 weeks okay, sorry 12 weeks paid maternity leave right the, the, the other unions the agreements were 13 weeks paid maternity leave and around that same period cost of living at and the country was one cent for every hour based on the rise in the in, in the index. Tivu made a major big breakthrough under the leadership of Joe Young. But three cents, I think it was three cents for every one point or three cents for every two points. It's easy to go back into history and look into the documents. So that Another major thing that Joe did with the event of the ISA and the Industrial Court we used to, uh, when I say we, myself and Aberdeen, because Aberdeen was the Chief Grievance Officer, I was the Grievance Officer, we would deal with matters with the employers up to the Ministry of Labor. And Joe would take it from there and deal with it in the industrial court. And sometime in the in the seventies, Joe said, "Every man Jack has to deal with the matter until it is finalized." So that um, I think Cecil made made a point about it. He did it in TU, so everybody had to. They deal with the employer, they go to the Ministry of Labor. If the matter goes to the industrial court, you handle it at the industrial court. And that was part of Joe's succession planning. I remember also with the 1969 strike, the bus strike, which was against a judgment of the industrial court. It was the first negotiation with PTSC that ended up in the industrial court and that strike. And the strike virtually collapsed. And I saw other leaders of the union crumble, crumble. I as a young, a young person, Young and, and by the way, when I when I met Joe, I was just about twenty two years old, and I I I I saw the leaders, certain leaders in leadership, crumble, and I was at advised as a young person, you're very talented, you had skill and thing, leave and go. If it means going abroad, leave and go. However, in talking to Joe Young, when I finished talking to him, and I believe when anybody with any issue or any problem spoke with him, you, you leave a thousand times stronger. You leave, you, 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 you leave rejuvenated. He was a true leader because a leader never show your weakness. Never. A leader never show your weakness. And whenever a leader show your weakness, you have to move away from such a leader. And Joe, Joe Young was the perfect leader. I don't think, I don't think we have, we had a, another leader like him in this country.
Shams stands for it. Um, we have to start ahead and shut down. But one thing people didn't know, right? Joe did not know his dad. Never met his father. I met Joe's father in in somewhere in the nineties. Um, his father was Thomas Young from Sydney. Kids, he migrated to the US to, to New York in 1910, 1918 or so. Um, he was a founder of a, of a union in the United States. Um, he was the biggest private sector workers union, private sector workers union, service workers union in New York City. There was 17,000 members. Thomas Young organized shut down the garment district. Uh, and we were going to play a, a video of, of, of a little celebration of the birth of, of that union and the history of it. But we don't play the internet stories that it's not working. But most people didn't know that. Um, Joe never met his, his, um, his, his dad. His mother came from the US in 1930. That's in 1931, 30, 32, and Joe was born here. And she remarried um, Donald Lally, I think, in that, that, was, that was his name. Um, I, I knew he made, that guy made daughters, and we have Joe's siblings, um, Uncle Bertram and Auntie Monica, and there's a sister living here, Auntie um, Alma. And uh, he said, this is Joe's, this is Joe's father, um, Thomas Young. Um, yeah, but the thing is, I mean, his brother supposed to also uh, talk a little bit, his 96-year-old brother, who's a doctor, who didn't know Joe much because when he came to Trinidad, Joe was, he was about eight years, he was about eight years older than Joe. And uh, Joe was born, and then by the time Joe was about eight or nine years old, he, he migrated and to study abroad. Um, but when Joe was about 14 years old, he disappeared um, from, from the Donald Street and went and spent his colleagues were but most people didn't know that Joe used to pick coconuts for a living. Right? Um, he, he disappeared from most people. And there was one thing that I wanted to talk about. Joe nearly dropped once with his family. I couldn't mention it to me, but his family on the beach. And I think he made a decision there that in his, in whatever power he has, nobody, no normal person, no regular working class person, no other person is going to, 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 to drown economically or without community. Keep the community outside of a Outside of our family, that's my mother there. She was going to, I don't know if she could, could if we could pay the thank you, that she, is, is, is it happening? Audio? Any audio? But what she said, she just said, she thanked people who worked, who worked with you. She thanked people like Rafi Shah, Basile Pandey. She appreciated um, him working and helping it's good things, good things. Yes. More volume. Okay. Okay. All right, okay. So, um, Grace, my mother, um, she is his wife, uh, who was committed to him all through her life. Um, she was an activist also. She, she was only chief organizer of, of the um, union on the campus. She, uh, the, um, she worked on developing the Credit Union on the campus, and she actively works in the church. 
COVID has hit her hard, but this is what she said this morning. Um, um, thanking everybody for, for thanking Winston Sweet, thanking me for working on this, thanking everybody for contributing. So, this is the people saying up. Yeah, well, we, <clears throat> before we close it, I, you know, Robert, I want to thank you especially because I think just sitting here, well, doing the work that you did over the last couple of weeks to find um, and to locate, find and take the time to record some of these conversations with a number of people who may not may even be challenged by the technology, but you've been so patient with it. And I, and I think that there's, there's something very, um, I mean, you have done with that very well. I mean, it's that to, to capture what you have, to be able to posit it into the memory of the country um, for future generations, for, for people living now, but also for future generations, I just think that it, it, it is extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine, Kellyanne Bob, who is a surgeon, who is the, a photographer with Phil, after seeing some of the photographs um, of the protests and how exactly those one letter words, I think that might have been done by Katasi, he was the main let um back and make up. Um, saying that this this has to be recorded differently. So Kelly and Bob did portraits of the poor whoever was the beautiful of that. Kelly portrait of portraits of you. But she got portraits of Winston Speech, she got portraits of Runa Redock, she got portraits of um, his childhood friend um Fuddy Ferrero, she got portraits of um uh Orwin Orin Booster. Albert. Albert Abedi, Trevor Fantasti, Gregory, Gregory Rousseau, Mar um, not Mario Adams, um, thank you, Banker General Workers, Banker General and Insurance Workers, for, for giving us um, some support in getting the, the, um, the, the video recorded. Um, and thank you, Erin Chandler, for, um, for doing uh, the, the, the branding work on, on this project. We attempted to teach it. To a level of uh, trying to to capture the capture the story well and, and also using the lesson of TU of being small, being effective, and being seen. So, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this as well. Okay, thanks, thanks, Susan. We have thanks, Susan, always talking about the uh, meeting to discuss privately the effects of. Living with people who are revolutionaries, um, activist parents, age yeah, age. Um, yeah, and, and just sharing because um, we might have met each other in passing when we were younger. Um, you're, you're, you're older than me. Not that much. Not, not, not that much older. Um, <laughs> but um, this has been an emotional um, piece to, for me because every time I am. Interview these men. Um, I heard stories I didn't hear, and I heard a level of caring my father had. That um, I could see um, because of doing, he just didn't know how to do the booth. He just didn't know how to do the booth. And he is you there because when um, already said. Leaders don't sh don't show emotion. don't show emotion or something. Weakness. I don't know what that. Weakness. Don't show weakness. Yeah. Um, sometimes weakness could be feeling. Um, the power is in the feelings, allowing allowing feelings to show. And I think the issue, the liberation work that we have to do now is for the, the men who lead this organization, the women who have led this organization or support these men in leading, get to do some emotional work to figure out was the next step because there's something blocking it. And it can't be that um, we have lost the zeal. We have to go to the places in our happy as we have where we have a lot of grief and work from there to find a new possibility because that what is demanded of us. We have to find new possibilities and going where the feeling of tired is there or it is too draining or it is too hard. Uh, to find the next step. Well, 
even I have all of us tearing up here on the set. I see Aaron welling up and so, so Winston, um, I'm going to throw it back to you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I, as you say, we are children of the revolutionaries, the men and women who made such a tremendous impact. I have my dad's story to do. Yeah. So that's the next project we need to work on. Yes, and, we um, work on a few of those. And a few of them, we need to, the people who are still around, to, to spend maybe a little more time documenting, as Ruben has said, because it's so important. There's so many parallels. And I thank you so much for the opportunity, both you and Winston. There's one thing I want to say. Um, my dressing room here at the club. Um, I am I going to, to I am going to um, to take those posters. I want to meet and find out who are those people. If you can find those people in the photographs in the process, cover this whole room with the photographs of the process and put cameras in there and let people come into sit in it and tell their stories about the protest, what they learned, what what solidarity they built. Um, so we can capture that period because it was a, a very significant period in the country. Winston. Winston, it's, we're throwing it back to you to wrap up first. Yes, yes, comrades, friends. What we have listened to is a man who has been described by some as the mighty Joyong. Yes, he was over six feet, but he was a giant not only physically, but he was a giant as a leader of men, as a pioneer in the industrial relations practice, a motivator of young men. And as several people testified that he has left a vacuum in the trade union movement, and as well in the national politics. The discussion raised several issues. One is the role of the trade union movement in the national politics. And where are we now as a nation in saluting the life and struggles of Zhou Yong I said at the beginning that this is in a context where we intend to recognize and elevate the memory of those who struggled for the process of nation building. This exercise, therefore, is about nation building and where we go forward. So I would thank to audience, both in the country and internationally, and you, can, you are invited to go to the various uh, sites where we have placed a number of the presentations for your own personal consumption. And I say, I wish to thank all those who made this exercise a resounding success. And I would leave you with this word that keep posting. We are going to continue to recognize our national heroes, lest we forget them. Thank you very much.